Hi, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of ASAP Pathway Podcast. I'm your host today, Dr. Stacy, and I'm just stoked to have this conversation with our guest today, Nicole Goldfarb. She is like a celebrity among the community of oral facial myology, speech language pathology. She is, you're the bomb.com, sis. You're amazing. Thanks for being here. That's funny, Stacy. <laughs> you. <laughs> you just are. You just are. You're amazing. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with Nicole, I'll, I'll give you a very, very, very small brief bio. Her bio is huge. If I read the whole bio, that would be the podcast. So I'm cutting it down a little bit and then we'll just dive into uh, maybe questions that you guys have, but definitely questions I have. Um, so without further ado, let me introduce Nicole. Nicole founded the San Diego Center for Speech and Myofunctional Therapy over 20 years ago, and she's been practicing speech language pathology since 2003 and oral facial myofunctional therapy since 2008. She's the 193rd certified oral facial myologist in the world. And in achieving her oral facial myofunctional therapy certification, she received the highest score ever appointed on the International Association of Oral Facial Myology certification exam at that time. Nicole also holds the distinction of being one of only a few certified oral facial myologists in all of San Diego County that also has her master's degree in speech language pathology, which is an unparalleled combination of degrees that allows her to provide the most advanced and comprehensive treatment as most patients with speech issues also have myofunctional issues. In addition to owning a private practice for 20 years, Nicole's, Nicole worked as a speech language pathologist in a school district for seven years, that's awesome, servicing thousands of children with speech and oral facial disorders. Nicole's accomplishments in the oral facial myofunctional therapy and sleep airway field are way too vast for me to mention in this podcast. They're huge. Um, like I said, it would take up the entire podcast. She's amazing. But one of the things I'm honored is that she is part of the faculty at ASAP Pathway. I mean, we are just beyond thrilled and honored to have you um, on our platform, helping people understand that function is so important, Nicole, is it not? It's about function. It is all about function. Not all as well, but, but it, but it's huge. It's a huge <laughs> piece. It's, and we talk about anatomy, of course, dentists are, you know, we're obsessed with anatomy. We uh, love, give us something and we're going to fix it. You know, very, uh, we're artistic, but mechanically driven as well. We want a beautiful before and after boom, let's change it. Um, so there are other pieces, the physiology, the, the function as well. So it's not just anatomy. And the more you dive into sleep, airway health, um, orthodontics, interceptive orthodontics, you're left hanging when you just address anatomy. If mm -hmm. that's all you're going to do and you're not going to look at a more comprehensive approach, you're left hanging. So where did you get your start in all of this? Okay, so um, I was a speech pathologist for about seven, eight years before I started working in the myofunctional therapy realm. Myofunctional therapy is not taught in any graduate program uh, for speech therapy. I think a few programs are starting now, so there might be like a handful of programs that even teach this, but otherwise it's not really addressed, which is absolutely crazy and ridiculous because there is such a direct connection with children and adults who have speech and language issues who also have underlying myofunctional issues, um, the majority of which would be like speech articulation. So a lisp, you know, maybe saying the word um, um, sun and saying fun with the tongue forward or like a slushy, like shun with a slushy sound or even issues on the R so sound, like saying wabbit for rabbit. Um, a lot of those speech issues actually have underlying muscle soft tissue dysfunction. And that needs to be addressed before the speech sound issue is treated. Otherwise, the speech issue may never fully resolve or may take years to resolve. 
So it's crazy that it's not just standard of academia in graduate programs for speech therapy. I mean, even this, if you kind of extend your thinking to um, a speech therapist, we work with children and adults who have language disorders, delayed language. Um, a lot of these children may also have issues with airway and sleep that's affecting their memory, their comprehension, their development. So we should all underlying training as speech therapists, but we don't. Okay. So I didn't know anything about this. And I was working in the schools for seven years, working with a lot of children who had speech issues, pulling them from class 30 minutes, once or twice a week for years. I mean, kids from like first grade to fourth grade are like missing class. We're doing drill and kill on that S sound for the list, doing better and getting so much better, but it's not fully resolving. So as they're leaving the speech room, they did a great job. They're leaving the room and they're telling me about their um, upcoming vacation. And all of a sudden the lisp is back. And I notice, wait, they have like, some of these kids have really large tongues. They look large mm. and their mouths are open and their mouth breathing and they have baggy eyes. And there's this kind of trend going on. And I knew what myofunctional therapy was. And that was in 2008. I got trained with the IAOM with Joy Moeller. Barbara Green and Leecha Pasque up in Los Angeles. And that changed my entire life, my entire career, the way I saw all my students in the school, all my clients, patients, my family members, my yes. friends. Nobody did I look Amen at the same to that. It's <laughs> it's like you can't unsee it once you see it. Exactly. So that kind of changed everything. I mean, it really did. And um, it really opened my eyes to this other piece of the puzzle. And back then it wasn't so much airway. Um, I had a mentor that I worked with and she had so many referral sources in our area of dentists and orthodontists, some ENTs as well, but it was about occlusion. It was working with patients referred by the orthodontist to help correct the orthodontic piece. But she, she was very, um, type A, just like me and most of us, she took diligent notes and she always wrote notes like, wow, so-and-so says they're not snoring anymore. Mm -hmm. By the way, side note, right? She had these from 40 years of treating patients. She had always commented, like people were always saying they don't snore anymore. They're, they feel better, you know, even though she was just working on the occlusion piece of the soft tissue component. And um, so a lot of the referrals were just for that reason. And then it started shifting more towards airway and breathing and seeing that link. And now we have a lot of research supporting that rule of myofunctional soft tissue dysfunction as a clinical marker for sleep apnea. And it all kind of comes together. So that was a long winded answer to how oh, did I no. get? That's great. <laughs> no, that's great. And it's funny because I mean, when you talk to most people that get into airway or sleep health, there's, um, they don't just wake up one day and want to do it usually. I mean, nowadays maybe, you know, cause there's so much awareness, but you know, 10, 15, 20 years ago, you know, you, you kind of got into it because you were seeing patterns and like, for instance, orthodontics, there were a lot of uh, orthodontic programs in the eighties and nineties that were all about, you know, let's try to save the teeth. Let's try to save the face, you know, make sure you have this beautiful full face, broad smile. It wasn't about the airway. It wasn't about sleep health, yeah. but what they were finding, like you said, um, when we orthodontically were doing appropriate things, whether it was myofunctional therapy whether it was, you know, early interceptive ortho to save the bicuspids and make room for the tongue, they also saw, you know what, this kid's not snoring anymore. And, you know, this kid is doing better in school. And why are they, why are their allergies a little bit better or their acid reflux gotten better? So I think a lot of us have kind of uh, stumbled in from, let's do this more for you know, preserving teeth, orthodontics, uh, longevity of orthodontic retention, less relapse if you get the function under control to, wait, what is this underlying, what is happening when you actually get the function under control and you make room for that tongue? Um, I know that a lot of people hear these big words were thrown around, speech language pathologist, oral, oral facial myology. Um, 
They're not the same thing as you just said. If you're going through a speech language pathology program, which is usually a master's degree minimum, correct? Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. That's a master's degree. Yep. So here they're coming out with a master's degree and you're thinking, well, surely they understand. So help me understand. So speech language pathology, what are they mostly focusing on as part of the therapy, SLP therapy? What yeah. is the therapy? If they're not really dealing with the muscle tone and the function of the face, what are they? What is what's happening? Well, it's kind of crazy when you think about it, because being a speech therapist and speech therapists and speech language pathologists are the same thing, exact okay. same thing. Um, we have to know a lot about a lot of different areas. So you get trained in all different areas and then you kind of pick your specialty. So it involves speech articulation, which is speech sounds. It involves people who might have comprehension issues, so receptive language issues, expressive language issues, delayed language, so little babies who aren't babbling or talking, social pragmatic language, so social skills issues, like issues with eye contact, nonverbal communication, people who have voice issues, so who might have hypo or hypernasal vocal quality, breathy voice, different vo voice issues, um, accent modification therapy, um, people who have cognitive issues working on memory, uh, daily living skills, fluency, so people who stutter. Um, and myofunctional therapy is just a modality of treatment that fits within some of those realms. But there's so much we have to know when you come out of grad school as a speech therapist. Some people work in schools, some work in hospitals, skilled nursing facilities, some work with babies, some work with adults. So there's so much that it's just not part of the curriculum because I don't really even know why. <laughs> you know, why is it not addressed? You know. It is interesting. It is really interesting because, um, you know, I have people in my town who are speech language pathologists, but also oral facial myologists as well. And it's like really um, unique to see that combination because people will assume one person knows exactly what the other person knows. So to have that combination is super helpful. Um, yeah, so and you can't right? You can't assume um, if you refer a patient to a speech therapist that they know about myofunctional therapy and that whole realm. It's almost like myofunctional therapy could be its own career because it is such a broad yet specific area of focus. There's a lot you have to know about a specific topic. And there's so many patients with that need with myofunctional disorder. A lot of people choose to focus their practice solely in that realm, but myofunctional therapy, it's not a separate uh, profession or separate license or separate career. It's a modality of treatment that not everybody who's in a speech um, pathology field knows what to do or how to treat. So you need that specific training. So who could, so people listening, um, say you're a dental hygienist or, I mean, what are other professions that are able to, um, go to get further educated on oral facial myology. Yeah. And different programs. So a lot of people just started their own training programs because it's not like a graduate program. That's right. Approved, right. So people start kind of their own programs. So different programs accept different people into their programs. Um, so it's a little murky. The water's a little murky there with like titles and titles after who gets the name. To, who's able to take a certificate now. And that's yeah. the other thing. Is there a certification? What? So there, it, it gets a little murky with some of the associations too, doesn't it? Yeah. It gets a little tricky and, you know, creating letters after a name and things like this, but what uh, the general people who are able to get trained or who do get trained in myofunctional therapy are speech therapists and dental hygienists. That would be the big, um, probably realm of people who have this training or seek this training. And you could also be an OT or a PT and also get this training, but you work on different components. Um, where speech therapists are more trained in the dysphagia aspect, the swallowing aspect. Um, some have training with the really young, the babies, the infants, the birth to three-year population, where it's a lot of foundational feeding and oral sensory motor that's more of the speech realm. Um, typical myofunctional therapy can be begin around the age of four. 
because it's more of an exercise-based program where the patient's able to understand what they're doing, know the goals, know, okay, I need my lips closed. We're working on getting my tongue up. I can imitate. I can do you know, 50 or 100 repetitions of this. We look in the mirror together. But when children are um, significant special needs or a lot younger, like birth to you know, three-year age range, um, there's a lot of foundational holes in their ability that need to be addressed by someone who has training with reflex integration and the um, oral motor. And that's usually the speech therapist who has that training. I don't. I don't work with babies. I don't work with infants. All the knowledge I have, and I don't have a specialty in that area. So if you're looking for someone working with really young kids, you want to make sure that that person has specific specific training prevention age group. And what the therapy looks like at that young age, it's a lot different than what I just described, where we're kind of looking in a mirror and doing certain right. movements. We're using tools, a lot of tools. So um, tools that might have different sensory components like vibration or different aspects, trying to work the, the feeding to be from a munching pattern to the back teeth, bilateral chewing. There's a whole developmental progression of how the mouth grows and develops and the movements of the tongue and the mouth and how feeding develops. And you need a lot of training to be able to understand and address that. That's not myofunctional therapy. So there is an important difference That's there. That's a really good point. So if they are four and older, because they have to do the work, they have to engage, it's exercise. They have to yeah. mirror, they have to do whatever instructions you're giving to them. And if they're under four, they're not going to be able to do that. And plus, like you said, there's just foundational integrative neurological things that may not have taken place yet where that could be successful. Is that right. correct? So right. Then and I, yeah. And I've taken courses for that young age group and I don't really feel comfortable working like with infants or the really young age group in terms of the feeding aspect of it. Um, all, we work in our office with children who have language delays and working on the floor and babbling and getting some motor movements, but a full oral motor, oral sensory motor feeding program, I refer out to somebody who's specifically trained in that. And you um, said that would be a speech therapist with specific training and would that be a feeding specialist? Could that feeding be specialist? Yep. Early intervention, feeding specialist. You can use words like oral sensory motor. There's OTs who also have that specific, specific area of training as well. Um, but when they're four and up, there's different things that maybe a speech therapist versus a dental hygienist versus a PT and an OT can address. Um, if there's speech articulation issues, of course, a speech therapist would be the better person to do the, the treatment. Um, sometimes... Uh, you know, PTs aren't going to work with someone who's like choking and gagging. That's more of like a speech therapy realm when we're talking about dysphagia. Um, and OTs tend to work on a lot of sensory and oral sensory skills. And they might work with uh, children who have picky eating, but more sensory based. There's a lot of really particular differences. And Robin Walsh did a really great um, graph of the different fields and what they address in those fields. So I'll share that with you. So you can put a link to that because oh, it would be great. Yeah. Yeah. Do. But honestly, it's a team approach. And the best thing is to just get these patients identified and get them treated, you know, yes. but if they're getting missed, then it doesn't even matter what we do. <laughs> well, and that's something that's super important. I was just had, um, a podcast with uh, Jameson, Dr. Jameson Spencer, just talking about the importance of screening. Um, a podcast before that I had with Kevin Boyd, Dr. Kevin Boyd, and it was just talking about behavior intervention. And the bottom line is you have to, you have to go beyond what we've learned in dental school. They're not teaching us how to screen for some of this stuff. So we really do have to do the due diligence of how to identify a child that has um, function issues. And when you see the train wreck occlusion or for a lay person out there, the, how the teeth come together, is the jaw too far back? Is the jaw too far forward? Is the maxilla too far back? Um, are they swallowing improperly? And then they're basically blowing out their front teeth and they're sticking out pacifier use. I mean, there's all this different stuff that we should be screening for to get intervention started early um, because you can make such an impact when they're young and insert yourself there and then have those conversations with people in your community. But back to screening, 
this is where the hygiene department and the dental practice or the assistants when they're seeing patients too, this is where that's imperative is to have your whole team on board. So do you think that in your average hygiene appointment, you could totally incorporate a very simple screening of function in a child? For sure. Um, dentists, dental hygienists are the perfect population to be identifying these issues because hopefully children are coming in every six months and you're looking in the mouth and that's where these issues are, right? Especially if we kind of shift the focus to like thinking about airway and sleep disordered breathing, that's where the screening should take place. Also other areas like, you know, even school nurses, there's a lot of people that could identify these things. Um, but the dental office is the best place to identify signs, early signs of oral muscular issues, oral dysfunction, and sleep disorder breathing. So it's, it's you're looking in the mouth and there's many features. The Ferris 6 is a great screening tool. Yes. Um, I'm on a team with uh, Dr. Gerald Simmons, the head of the team, and there's um, about 20 people from across the United States, and it's called the Children's Airway Screener Task Force, CAST. And we're developing a universal screening tool that all dentists will use to screen all children in the United States as part of the October 2017 um, protocol by the American Dental Association. So we're developing a very simple, basic tool that is going to be research based. So we're in that that phase where we're actually uh, you know, sampling it. And we're sampling it among a variety of different dental offices. But there's going to be five basic questions that parents will fill out. So it's kind of a shift from what is the dentist or the dental hygienist looking at, but what form you will give this form, or maybe it's on the iPad to parents with five basic yes and no questions that will be able to be the first step in identifying whether a child might be at risk for sleep disorder breathing, and then there'll be a part B and more steps to it. So um, that would be in dental offices with the goal of school nurses, pediatricians, you know, there's autism screenings. Visions, right. you know, there's right. more to fill out these little checklists. Well, maybe this would be incorporated in the, the pediatrician office for every well visit. And Love there's it. A lot of, yeah, hopefully um, we just have to make sure it's really truly identifying because we don't want to catch too many kids. You want to kind of weed out the ones that don't have the issues. So we have a good <laughs> sample. So it's in that phase of seeing how valid our questions are by doing sleep studies on children um, based on the answers to these questions. So it's a part part A, and then there's a part B with more details if someone does not pass that screening. Um, but think of it, parents, because they can identify these things. Some of the questions, only five questions entail like the air pathway. Does your child breathe through the nose or the mouth? Um, behavioral issues, uh, sleep, snoring. You know, there's a, there's a few questions that are supposed to be the best to I ask parents to be able to identify red flags in their child. So, yep. So to bring it back, the dental office, I think is the best place for this to begin. I agree. And I, again, I, you know, Steve Carstensen um, is, has coined the phrase basically, you know, has the dental office or dental practice become the primary care of the airway where we are kind of screening and then we are identifying and then we are punting and, you know, kind of quarterbacking, which which specialty we should be sending to. And I really believe that we're just positioned as a really optimal healthcare provider to intercept and identify and get these kids appropriate care. You, we had talked earlier before we got on and started recording, just you hear the phrase evidence-based all the time, evidence-based dentistry, evidence-based medicine. And, you know, I think a lot of people assume evidence-based just means research and research is great. I mean, if we didn't have research, we'd still be leeching people, right? Like blood, you know, Hey, <laughs> let's throw some leeches on you and it should get rid of your, you know, whatever. <laughs> I mean, we, there is a place for research for sure, but to put everything on research, I won't, I'm not going to change paradigms in my practice or I'm not going to learn something new until all the research comes out. Well, you're going to be about a decade behind if you're going yeah. to do that. And you're going to miss so many opportunities to help 
patients in your practice and your family and your community. Um, I also say to people, this is why you have to have conversations. Like you have some amazing, beautiful before and afters of changes in function of quality of life of, you know, occlusion faces. I mean, it's, a, it's amazing sleep health. Um, what are some pretty amazing before and afters that you have seen in your practice that says, Hey, like this is worthy of us, you know, putting our attention on, on function. Yeah. There's so many visible changes and also quality of life changes that we see on a daily basis. Um, we don't treat teeth. So as myofunctional therapists, we're very careful to not say we're going to fix your teeth, move your teeth, right? We're not movers of teeth. We fix the soft tissue dysfunction, right? So the oral muscular soft tissue issues of oral rest posture, chewing and swallowing of foods, liquid saliva. And when that gets corrected, the icing on the cake is the occlusion may get better. The sleep may get better. The breathing gets better. Those are all secondary to treating yes. the underlying issues, right? So I'm very careful in my office to not tell patients that even though the orthodontist might have referred you and you see these great before and after photos, that's not our responsibility. It might happen, <laughs> but I explain why. And I let them know that the tongue can put 55 up to 500 grams of force on the teeth. The tongue can move the teeth, the pressure of the tongue on the teeth. The lips can help mold the, the, the way the mouth grows and the tongue helps shape the palate. And I describe it all to them. And what happens when the lips and tongue aren't resting in the correct position. But once we get that going correctly, then it will help your orthodontic treatment or, you know, and so some of the great changes I've seen are occlusion changes. I mean, sometimes with myofunctional therapy alone and no orthodontic or dental treatment, open bites close. Mm. Um, even I had a 17 year old, I was working on a presentation and I was deciding if I should hide the slide or keep the slide. Um, but the teeth, his open bite closed in just a few weeks of myofunctional therapy his teeth were able to shift back. His lips were able to support the teeth and he was a mouth breather. And um, his orthodontist had to take a whole new set of orthodontic photos. He was blown away when this kid went back to his office to start the treatment because he had to do all new, totally had to redo his treatment plan. He, the he looked like a whole new kid. He had a whole yeah. new... And you wouldn't think like, oh, a 17 year old, but you know, I'm not saying there's necessarily bony growth changes at that age, but the the teeth can definitely shift and move and young children, the tongue can, can change bone. It can change the way the bone grows. I mean, if you even think in fetal development, mm -hmm. the tongue should be resting on the roof of the mouth. And if it's not typically, you know, from a tongue tie, which occurs in uter uterine development, right? When the baby's born, the baby will be born with a high, narrow palate as a reflection of the tongue posture in utero. In utero, exactly. Right? Isn't that crazy to think about that? Like it's already occurring then. Function, <laughs> rest posture is already impacting the way the bones grow. So um, so before and after pictures, I have a bunch of like just, you know, on the weekly basis looking at changes in occlusion and also changes in breathing and quality of life. I mean, just like evidence-based, like you're saying, just things that patients tell us. I try to do questionnaires often. So like a new patient questionnaire for the new patients, I have a lot of sleep questions and a lot of behavioral and functioning questions like the PSQ, but a bunch yeah. of additional ones, right? And then I like to do those again at the end of the active phase of therapy. And then again, it throughout some of the monthly phases to look at changes. And I mean, PSQ scores going down substantially. Parents just commenting, they have a new child. You know, my child is sleeping better. I have so many adults who um, say they, like they might use lip tape um, as part of our overall program. And they say they sleep so much better. They will never stop using that. They wake up refreshed. So there's so many like qualitative and quantitative visual changes that we see. It's pretty amazing. It is amazing. I mean, this is where, you know, right now it's a very um, interesting time in sleep and airway. Uh, at times it can be 
a little bit uh, spicy, if you will. <laughs> Sometimes there's some back and forth, you know, um, and I think that it's just so important for people to uh, be advocates for their own health, listen to things like this, listen to um, other podcasts, Airway Circle, all these different, you know, educational platforms. Be your own advocate, be your child's advocate. Um, it would be wonderful if we had all the research that we want right now. It's just not happening. What's We're not going to have it right now. What is happening is we are driving that research now. We are living in a very exciting time, I think, for collaboration with looking more at function, anatomy, uh, collaborating with our medical colleagues, looking at vitamin D levels, looking at nutrition, looking at gut health, ferritin levels. Um, it's all connected. And yes. we need all of us working together and having these conversations so that we could be our optimal selves. I mean, we're just, unfortunately, kids are probably eating the worst that they've eaten in history right now. And we have just a lot of processed foods, preservatives, um, no fiber, really poor gut, gut microbiome health. Um, children aren't chewing their food. So if we look at diet, are you incorporating that into your program? Like, look, I want you to eat crunchier foods. I want you to chew. I don't want you, everything's like, everything's uh, processed and in these little pouches. So no one chews their food anymore. And they have just such low tone, these kids. Yeah. Yeah. I was just uh, talking with a baby led weeding expert yesterday. We were talking about this on her podcast and we know that one of the big contributing factors to the de-evolution of the human face is our diet, right? And those epigenetic changes of processed soft foods, mastication builds and forms bone. That chewing and using the muscles is going to help build the jaw bones to help grow them wide and forward when we have good tongue posture. And that component is so important. And when I had my kids and they were really little, I didn't know about these things. Me neither. I got the sucking pouches. I, I got the Wubbinub pacifier because it was recommended to me. The pacifier with the plushie that hangs off of that one. Oh, yes, know? yes. Like that, you know, the recent research came out about that, that grams of force and it only makes perfect sense. Not only is a pacifier not good, but then you hang a stuffed animal off of it. And that's really going to impact the teeth and the palate. And I did everything wrong. Um, I pureed the foods for the kids and yeah, so we have to deal, <laughs> we have to deal with the effects of that. So yeah, we definitely want our patients to know about eating a variety of foods and textured foods mm -hmm. and chewing on both sides of the mouth and bringing the food to the back teeth to chew. In myofunctional therapy, we teach all about that and how to use the tongue correctly, how to chew with our lips closed. Um, oftentimes there's an underlying reason though, why the person has the chewing dysfunction and that's what we address in therapy. Is it a tongue tie? Are they congested? So they have to chew with their mouth open right. to get, you know, there's so many different components. And then you just talked about vitamin D and ferritin. And it's almost like the more, you know, the less, you know, right. It's that's like, so oh, true. <laughs> there's so much to this. And I think as we get into this and we learn about this for our patients and our families and ourselves, more little things, avenues open up. And if we're really like narrow-minded into like airway, we might miss other pieces. I've had so many patients who have non-airway related sleep issues or yes. complications up. So, um, so there's a lot, you know, a lot to know. And that's where, you know, teaming up with our colleagues, our sleep medicine doctors, our dentists, our orthodontists, OTs, PTs, like all of us just communicating together and listening to these podcasts, we're able to help our patients better. A hundred percent. Right. That multidisciplinary input. Yeah. A hundred percent. And, and that's the other thing too, is just, I mean, we have to be vulnerable and put egos aside in this. Um, and, and, you know, something that Jameson Spencer said in the last podcast I had with him was, you know, somebody that's practicing the same way for the last 20 years, you know, that's, that's not necessarily an admirable thing. 
you have to be able to say, is it possible that I'm missing something? It's not about me being right. It's about me doing what's right. So being open and is there room for change in my practice? Is there room for me to have some conversations and, you know, to have these conversations, you have to be vulnerable and say, I don't know everything. And hmm. I think that's hard sometimes for certain practitioners to say, I don't have all the answers because sometimes, especially in dental school, it was kind of ingrained that you had to have all the answers and look like you had all the answers. So you didn't want to look like you might not have the answers, but having those conversations and maybe just going to lunch. I mean, you know, and saying, Hey, I'd love to see some before and afters, or can you tell me what, you know, as an ENT or as a, as a SLP or as an oral facial myologist, you know, what are you comfortable treating? What's your ideal population demographic you want me to refer to? What patients do you not want me to refer to you so that I make sure we have a good relationship with each other and we're both set up to uh, succeed. Um, as far as airway goes, my gosh, I mean, I've been seeing adult airway patients for over 20 years and the function issues I'm seeing now, what would you say, like your, you, you can see the four-year-old and up and you can make such an impact on that four five, six-year-old. How long does it take typically? And I know it's going to be different based on compliance. Do they do the activities? Do they show up? Are the parents engaged? But what is the average length of time for therapy? Say an orthodontist refers to you for tongue thrust or some other function issues. What's the length of time that you're, you have that patient in therapy and then maybe on a maintenance program? Yeah. So again, it really will depend, like you just said, on- right the age, the motivation and compliance, um, and the number of factors. So I have this checklist, maybe I could pull it up and, um, and kind of read it, but I always let parents know prog or patients, any age progress in therapy depends on, and I list a bunch of factors, the number of underlying issues. And we, that's revealed in the diagnostic evaluation. So the number of medical issues, myofunctional issues, um, the age of the patient, clients, motivation, the child, the parents' ability to help the child because the child can't do the exercises on their own. They're usually going to be, need to be supervised or monitored. And um, other life circumstances, like is the family moving? Are you, you know, other things that may impact your, your lifestyle and how you can stay on your routine. But typically, um, we have a learning phase in therapy, which I would call like an active phase. And it's about eight to 10 appointments. So like once a week for about two, two and a half months, where we see our patients and teach them all they need to know and do in terms of muscle functioning. So we kind of start one step at a time, build strong muscles, then work on the functioning, the chewing and the swallowing. And then we fade back to once a month. And we do that for that first year. After that first year, we fade back even more, and it might be every three months, every six months, like that. So it really, though, depends on the reason they were referred and where they are in their orthodontic treatment phase if they're undergoing orthodontics. I like to stick with my patients throughout the course of their orthodontics, even if it's just every few months, um, and throughout that first year of the retainer, the retention phase as well. Um, and... For adults, they might have to do some exercises for life. They might have to continue to do things for the rest of their life, small things. For children, they can typically make the changes to establish good or rest posture, chewing and swallowing, and maybe not even have to think about it again after they've gotten through and sort of retrained the muscles and the neurological patterns. Um, but it really, there's so many different like factors and components that would determine how long a treatment program would take. But I kind of go about that, yeah. like active phase, month type, um, type phase uh, of therapy. Oh, that makes sense too. And it makes sense that the adult, since it wasn't caught early, they're just going to have to have some kind of lifetime maintenance. Just like when you, when you go to the gym, I mean, you're going to have to maintain and work on yourself regardless. Um, so that does make sense. And, yeah, and you know, the bones have firmed up in an adult, there might be skeletal um, issues that won't change. You know, not everybody's going to get expansion or jaw right. surgery, 
right? So some people may have to do certain things um, to ensure those muscles stay strong. And that neurological patterning is so ingrained the older we get that it is sometimes hard to really make everlasting changes in certain avenues without having some conscious awareness on and off, you know, throughout throughout time. So um, I have certain exercises that some adults will kind of want to do forever in the car on the way to work, or if they notice, maybe they stop doing everything and they might notice that their tongue might start feeling a little wide or kind of starting to rest low. They just go back and do a couple things, or some adults might use the lip tape um, if it's prescribed for them based on specific criteria um, right. that they might want to do that forever. Whereas kids, it's like they're done at a certain point and they're sleeping with their lips closed. So it's amazing. It's pretty amazing. Those kids. I mean, again, (laughs) if we could get to them early, just that trajectory completely changes, completely changes the trajectory. I mean, adults better late than never. Right. But man, the impact you can make when they're little is just mind blowing. Yeah. Um, so where we're, do you see, what were you going to say, Nicole, it got, we were talking at one point um, earlier before the podcast about like soft tissue dysfunction and malocclusion. And um, I believe it's Dr. Herman Ramirez said that soft tissue dysfunction is the cause of malocclusion. And Dr. Derek Mahoney, orthodontist in Australia says that 100% of orthodontic cases should have a myofunctional therapist on their team. So if we want to look at like the underlying cause of dysfunctional jaw growth, we want to look at how the tongue and lips are resting and functioning and their impact on the skeletal component. And it's so important to know that if we're just addressing the teeth, you're addressing the symptom. And there's oftentimes a high risk for relapse. I mean, in the International Journal of um, Orthodontics, there's a quote, I forget the year, but it talks about there's a very high risk for relapse with patients with anterior or lateral open bites who have not undergone myofunctional therapy. So when the appliance is removed, see relapse. We've had patients who finally get referred to us after their third round of orthodontics. Um, I've had patients third round of expansion and it, the arch just collapses again. And it's definitely a team a, a team teamwork between the orthodontist or dentist and the myofunctional therapist. But if you're not addressing how the lips and tongue rest, how the person chews and swallows to maintain that good muscle tone of that tongue up, lips closed, teeth slightly apart, then we're likely to just see everything go back to the, or regress to the way it was before. And that also includes the symptoms like breathing, yes. deep issues. So, um, yeah, making those everlasting changes definitely requires myofunctional therapy to be part of that treatment protocol. Do you see, so what, just to talk about the future a little bit, do you see, I mean, I personally think we're going to start seeing way more collaboration and between um, the different disciplines. I think medicine and dentistry are in the next five years going to explode. We're looking at more airway, sleep health, um, early intervention, diet. Um, where do you see your profession uh, in the next five years? Do you do you feel that there are changes being made now? What is happening? What's the murmuring? What, what's the hope that you have that you're going to see more collaboration? Yeah. I mean, I do see this getting into speech therapy graduate programs. I don't know if it's going to be five years or 10 years, but I do see that that change will probably occur. A lot of people are learning about this, not training in this, but learning about this through social media. Like on a Facebook group, hi, I'm a speech therapist in the school. Here's a picture of my, the student I work with, the mom approved for me to post this picture. What is this? you know, what do I see? How, and and those of us who know, we're like, oh my God, how do you not know about this? Because it was never, you know, this is such a missing piece. So I do feel like through that sort of pressure, this should probably get into academia more, um, you know, in the near future. So I do see that. Um, I do see a lot of people have interest in oral facial myofunctional therapy as their career or their profession. It wasn't like this as much before, but now it's way more common for people to uh, be myofunctional therapists. So I feel like that's going to grow. And 
the shift is probably going to start to be more sleep airway related. Our patients referred for those issues versus just like the orthodontic piece. I mean, I've already seen that shift and I have a lot of my referrals now are people learning about this online for themselves or their child versus getting a referral from a professional. Yeah, I do get a lot of referrals from professionals, but it's really interesting. Like, I think it's probably over the last five years or less that referrals are like social media, Google mm -hmm. versus Dr. So-and-so. And, -so. and I, I have true. to tell you, it's so funny. Like my office manager sent me, she messaged me this morning, asked me about a patient that just got referred today. And I just have to tell you sort of a little um, gist of what this patient said. It's a, a parent. Ah, let me just look at this. Oh yeah. Okay. Um, we sent a video about what myofunctional therapy is. So the parent thought that's great. This is so interesting. I want to get scheduled for both my kids. One's uh, like nine and one's 10 and a half. Okay. My son has been grinding his teeth in his sleep since he had teeth. Our dentist, of course, has been saying that he will just grow out of it. But now I no longer believe that. He is now snoring and mouth breathing more. And I hear him catching his breath like my husband's sleep apnea. He's also continually congested and has oral habits of licking his lips and chewing on things. He's 10 and a half. Hmm. The brother, age nine, blah, 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 similar things. And his teeth are terribly crooked. So this is a parent who was referred because she wasn't referred. She's no longer like believing because she's seeing how bad this issue has progressed, right? Because the dentist was unaware that bruxism is not like a normal behavior, right? Right. And there was an early sign since he had teeth. Wow. Like that gives me the chills because he's now 10 and a half and gasping for air in his sleep. So what, I don't want to say brain damage because that's really strong words. Right, but right. But what deficits could there be? What, you know? So not I as, kind of, he's not his best self. He, he hasn't been his optimal self all those years. Right. And I've seen that with my own kids. So I know, and I yeah. know the changes that can occur when these things aren't addressed or when they are. And um, so when I, when you ask about like changes, I think a lot of parents and, you know, people on their own are going to start learning about these things and refer, being self-referrals for help maybe not as much referred by other medical professionals. I mean, I would hope that yeah, wouldn't be. You would it. hope. And I think what you said is promising. You know, I think if we can start seeing the educational platforms change and we start to see these things taught in academia, that would be wonderful because now you have more awareness in the practitioners, more screening is because it was just part of the curriculum. Right now, to learn this, you have to kind of step out of the paradigm and think outside the box and get extra education and have the drive to do so. Um, so I think that is very promising that we would okay. see that, you know, incorporated. You feel like in orthodontic or dental programs, this will be taught at some I, point? I hope. Well, if we start to see the um, myofunctional aspects taught in the SLP programs, I think you would organically start to see maybe more education just in general in academia. I would hope the fact that Audrey Yoon is incorporating sleep in her orthodontic residencies at the University of Pacific. I mean, ah, huge. like that's huge, huge. So I I do think it's coming. I just we all want it right now, but I think it's coming, and it's it gives me hope. And in the meantime, like you said, as much as I despise social media. I freaking love it because it's really giving like what we're doing right now. You know, it's empowering patients to take um, their health into their own hands. And if they're not getting answers at their current physician, it doesn't make them a bad physician. It's right. just not being taught. So what you do is you just pick up and you try to find a physician that's aligned with your goals and what you're concerned with, because they may just not know. And you yeah. just have to, I mean, sometimes you have to go to three or four ENTs before you find an ENT that kind of understands sleep and airway more. They don't all right. understand sleep. They, and not, I think with like that easy access to information, you know, looking things up online, this, this whole kind of social media, but also just computer and internet, yes. that, that 
people don't necessarily just accept what their doctor is saying. If you truly feel something is wrong, parents and even um, adults are going to find other answers. They're going to research more. So I think this is going to be a good way where change is progressively occurring is because people aren't just accepting like, no, or that's normal. If a medical practitioner tells them that they're looking for second opinions and they're researching on their own. Um, and I, like when I had kids, you know, 12 years ago, my first kid, um, it wasn't as prolific, all this information. It no. wasn't easy. You just kind of accepted. Oh, okay. You know, oh, snoring. Okay. That's normal. Oh, his tonsils are grade three plus, but they're not red and inflamed. So I guess that's fine. Yeah. Didn't need any <laughs> antibiotics X amount of times a year. So, I mean, we all are doing the best we can, my gosh. I mean, it's just hard to be a parent. It really is. And I mean, all the information can be a blessing, but it also can be a curse because sometimes there's analysis paralysis and I, I get these moms and they don't know where to start. And they've been up literally obsessed online and now they're confused and they don't know where to go. So I really feel that, you know, it's our job as the healthcare providers to help these parents navigate all the information that's out there because as great as it is, it's overwhelming as well. So, um, that's so it's yeah. true. um, I know we got to get off here and, uh, I'm so appreciative that you, um, carved out a little time today for me and, and for the audience. I don't want to talk stop about talking. This. I know. <laughs> Can I we know. <laughs> I'm like, we could literally, I mean, so we'll have to have you back because there's so much to say. There's so much to talk about. Um, but before we go, I would like to ask you my three little personal questions that have nothing to do with anything that we just talked uh -oh. about. Okay. Uh -oh. So yes. when you were, when you were little, what was your favorite toy? Your most fond memory of your, your favorite toy when you were little, okay. little, I don't remember little, little, but I'm a soccer player or I was, ah. I don't know I was but I played soccer my whole life. The soccer ball. I had a soccer ball on this stretchy, almost like a TheraBand type, like one of those things you used to work out and you could tie it around your leg, you Velcro it on your leg and you could kick the ball to yourself. They have that still, but I feel like it's not as exciting for kids because of all the, of all the other have. stimulation now they, they have. have. Like yeah, VR balls, yes. and, but this was like a real life soccer ball and you could kick it back and forth. And I just sit there and kick the ball, juggle the ball. Yeah. So I, I guess I would say soccer ball. I don't the know. Soccer ball. <laughs> what was that called? It was like, a, it had like a, I know exactly what you're talking about. I think my cousin had one. Yeah. And it was around his ankle or whatever. Yeah, you put it around your and it bounces right back to you. So you don't need to have anybody who's playing with you. And yeah, I don't know. I don't know what it's called. I got one for my son, but I think he just was like bored of it. He's like, oh, I'm I'm enough stimulation. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay. What was your favorite cereal? Probably Fruit Loops. I still will eat Fruit Loops. Like if we have a buffet in a hotel or something <laughs> and I go to the kids section and I sneak or, you know, the little box of fruit. I mean, yes. it's just so bad and good. It's so funny. It's my daughter. She, she texted me the other day. I mean, here we're talking about diet. Like she goes, mom, please, please. Can I have a box of Fruit Loops in the house just for me? I'm like, oh, that's just so gross and nasty. And I throw it in the, I got it. I put it in there. She plowed through that. Oh you man, did. I I loved that stuff growing <laughs> up. Like, because it made the milk taste. I hate milk. But if I had like a sugary, really like, you know, cocoa puffs or whatever, it would turn my milk into a different flavor. Yep. Well, I when mean, we, would go, we would go to the East Coast every summer. I have family in Virginia, Maryland. And, um, that would be the only time my parents would let me have sweet sugary cereal is they buy the little like travel packs, you know, at the store. Of the yes. and my brother and I are totally opposite. So he'd take the frosted flakes and the pops. Remember that cereal oh, pops. Yeah. And I would take the, soups, the cocoa puffs and all the like really sugary <laughs> side of that and all artificial coloring. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, I guess. Oh my gosh. It's, the so, win. <laughs> it's so funny. And it's, it's like, I mean, when we, I mean, it's so funny because now they have like a bazillion cereals, but when we were growing up, there was like, I don't know, five or six cereals or five or six channels. I mean, everything was very similar. We had very similar backgrounds. Now they have like a bazillion cereals and a bazillion channels to pick from. It's like, 
It was a lot, sim- <laughs> lot simpler back then. And then what is your favorite vacation destination? One of your favorites. Okay. I'm the like tropical beach. Like I'm not, I don't need to tour museums and do all that type of stuff, but like put me on an Island and I would, that'd be great. So I love Hawaii. Mm -hmm. Um, Hawaii is probably my favorite place so far that I've been. And I've been a few times. So I just love like the rustic feel, you know, chickens running around the street and you got the beach and the palm trees. And, um, I think I would say Hawaii is my favorite. Oh, what a beautiful place. It's so beautiful there. It's well, I appreciate yeah, it's a good vibe. Yeah. I appreciate you, Nicole. Thank you so much for being here. Um, we'll have to have you back. There's a lot to say. Um, and thanks for carving time out of your day for all of us to help us better understand um this much, much needed area of healthcare that makes such an impact. Thank you for your education that you provide. It's so appreciated from professionals and patients. So thank you. Oh, thank you. And thanks for being ASAP faculty. We're so flipping lucky to have you. We really appreciate you. I enjoy it. All right. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you all soon.